many years people have gone to sea on the quest for adventure. But what does it really mean to be a sailor? For us, we are about to find out. Lower your topsail, rail up your mizzen, and bring your ship under my leash. Or I'll give to you a boot and a ball, and drown all your merry men in the sea. crossing, we decided the best route would be to go 130 miles offshore from Florida all the way to Texas. <laughs> Anticipating a 10 day sail in our crossing from Florida to Texas, I had my father and brother join us yep. as crew. Kind of so you guys uh, come along and go shopping with us? Oh, we got just about everything. Oh, so we're ready to go? With just a few things left to get at the store and a um, pile of boat projects just to be more yeah, comfortable, there were really only a few list. that There's we really had to take care of before we could actually get going. Us. Also, last night, the water pump kind of broke. For the uh, uh, water pressure? What do you mean it kind of broke? Because then it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So to me that means that there is uh, something in it. Uh, something either clogging the filter or in the pump itself. Okay. There's the dinghy. Dinghy motor. Yep, yep. Oh, yep. nice. You guys fixed that uh, problem it was having? Yeah, I fixed the problem. Oh, I now, and, and, and at the same time also hurt myself. <laughs> well, that's so. interesting. Closer in dinghy damage that got messed up. It looked like it tore up your uh, mount down there. Uh, it might have done something. Right here? Yeah. Uh, but but that's always been a little loose. Yeah. Uh, thank you for reminding me because I still have to put that set screw back in. Blew that up. I was thinking of uh, packing tape to fix that, but no, that's not gonna help it. Nope. Wasn't that? See, I mean, like that guy over there. His dab it used to be pointed downward. The Lemarie from Key Largo right there. Uh huh. So about closest. Uh, that davit used to be pointed down on this side where oh. you could see the panel. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, that bent the davit. This, but this davit did not get bent. It's a tougher davit, but it fucking popped out.
While we tackled all the projects and hard work, thoughts were brewing on our mind of this crossing, and we heard rumors of pirates. And then you have to um, be careful of them then. But, They'll uh, be like, oh, we need help. And then I you see. Have to, the best thing to do is say, oh, we'll get someone to. Yeah, we're, oh, we're, we're, we're on the radio right now with the Coast Guard to get someone out here to help you. <laughs> They'll pull up. Yeah, no yeah, shit. And so it was back to work for everyone to finish up projects just before we could head off and set sail. Once we got all the work done, I decided to take out my brother for a nice little tour around the block uh, with a dinghy motor and then eventually paddling because the dinghy motor died. But you know, that's it. You're not going to you know, talk about that. Yeah, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace that line that's in there. As the rain had set in for the evening, we all sat around goes, thinking you know, about how majestic that this experience could potentially be. Back to You'll be able to see outside, um, but I took the we well first on my way back from Billy's the first time riding the dinghy ever, which had died like 15 times. It can get really dark out on the water, so it's gonna. It's, I feel like it's gonna be a really really wonderful experience, but we're going to definitely need to know the boat very well before. And so, finally, it was leaving day. We had taken care of all the projects that we could, and we had a rigger come and inspect the rig as a final last thing before we could head out on the open seas. So it was finally time to say goodbye to the neighbors and set sail across the horizon. Ready? Yep. Thank you. And just like that, our adventure began. going out and the winds going out and we're going out 11:40 local time Once we got underway, we realized that having the dinghy on the foredeck was not really a good option because it would take the whole foredeck up for the entire duration of the trip. Little did we know, putting the dinghy on the davit was going to be a lot more of an issue than we anticipated.
What you may remember is that we lost a solar panel in Hurricane Irma. But what also happened was the dinghy davit also got messed up because the foot of the dinghy davit is on a piece of wood and that wood had dry rotted. Well, during the hurricane, the dinghy popped out of its foot and then it no longer was able to, to be stable. So we had to make a improvised foot uh, for just this crossing so we could put the uh, dinghy on the dab and clear up the fore deck. Well, that's when disaster struck and the solar panels wind up going down almost into the water. It really was no easy task to get this davit back into its foot. With the weight of the solar panels pushing on it and everything else, we were exhausted. So with the dinghy davit in a all right condition, it was time to lower the dinghy into the water. Now this also turned out to be a bit more the pain than we'd anticipated with the boat moving and with the dinghy moving. I'm not going to say that I fell in the water, but I fell in the water and I fell in the water. Anyway, uh, and so we finally got the dinghy right up onto the davit so we could sail off and continue on our adventure. Once we had made it out of this pretty long channel, it was finally time to put the sails up and sail. the sails up and the crew's spirits high, everyone started to settle into a routine. Oh, well. <laughs> I I'm recording a video. Oh. <laughs> Miss all the chaos and of me falling in the water, the dinghy davit popping out and getting all those things fixed. One of the crew had grabbed the helm and had turned really hard on it, but that was when the autopilot was engaged. So it was a quick jury rig fix to try and fix the clutch on the autopilot because it was broken. This was of course later fixed with a bungee cord and duct tape because that's how problems always get fixed. But it was of course because of the clutch that we wound up mostly having to hand steer pretty much the entire trip. Which if you haven't done before is really arduous and long and exhausting. So for us we soon found that there's really only three things to do while you're underway. One of them is to make sure that you don't run into anything or anyone else. The second one is to make sure the boat doesn't sink because inevitably there's boat maintenance while you're out there and things, things just break, they just do. Now the last thing is whatever you can find to keep yourself occupied. That's reading a book, that's working on whatever it might be, but there's not a whole lot different. But when it is different, it gets too exciting too quick.
one of the things that we really enjoy about Salem is that there's never a mundane. There's always something different. Like here, the propeller was spinning even though the motor wasn't on, just because we were moving through the water. Always interesting. Unfortunately, that was not what this was. This meal was prepared without using the refrigerator, which means all the ingredients were not fresh and also didn't taste that well either. But this was just our first experiment trying to cook at sea. As we ate, we continued to watch the horizon and the sun slowly setting into it. We had no idea what the night would hold. As the winds increased and as our bellies were full, half of the crew got super sick and were vomiting pretty much the entire night. Hi, the restless windy night. Now it's almost calm. We're moving along at two knots. Shrugging off some seasickness. About an hour ago, or no less than that. About an hour ago. Looks like Dean is on the horizon there. Initially thought it was a boat. Uh, it looked like a red light. It's just really hazy near the horizon. So it just appeared red. It's white now. Just how spring was to a flower, the sun was to us that morning. It was such a rough night and most of the crew was sick. It wasn't anything like seeing a wonderful sunrise. Well, at least most of the crew saw the sunrise. The day mostly consisted of boat projects keeping on course and, well, the rest of the crew trying to recover, which is also why there's not a lot of footage from this day. As night set in, the winds began to rise, something we'd soon learn would be the normal for the days would be very still and the nights very strong. Uh, looking for flying fish. They uh, were there just a second ago, but they're fast. We had one wash up on the deck last night and went back in. Oh, the fish jumping. The tuna. There's a fish that just came under the boat. Big one? Although not satisfied with the two knots that we were making, we had no idea what the wind would do next. We were becalmed. In the middle of the entire gulf, 130 miles offshore, absolutely no wind. With a deadline to make, we decided it was time to start the motor. 
but the motor wouldn't start. Now we are left with no option but to try and fix the motor at sea. So down I went to try and figure out what the problem was. Through priming the fuel system and cracking the injector nuts to get the motor to go, it finally rained. And then, like clockwork, the wind picked right up. Soon as the sun had set, the wind had started to increase, and so we shut the motor and saved. We had gotten pretty well into our routines, where there would be two of us to a team, and each team would either be on watch or asleep. The next day, early in the morning, one of the crew rushed in and woke me up. They had spotted a potential skiff on the horizon. Now because we had heard so much about these pirates, we were all a little concerned. So we rushed up, grabbed the binoculars, and kept a weather eye on this potential skiff. <laughs> all right, it just course. Sound by tell west. Yeah, it's back to 240, yeah. But I wanted to say it that way. I wanted to have a good speed. Yeah, like I said, you're getting out of here. <laughs> That's why we, uh... As we inched closer and closer to the skiff, we finally got a good understanding of what it really was. It was a big trawling motorboat that was out there in the middle of the Gulf fishing on some sort of a fishing venture. Now we're not exactly sure as to whether or not they were fishing legally, but they were definitely fishing. No, no, not even. No, maybe like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, he just popped up with the sun. Now it was at this moment when he turned on both of his engines and really sped away. Now it may be because he tried to hail us on the radio and we didn't respond. But we were just trying to cruise through and didn't really care. But maybe it was because he was doing something that was illegal and didn't want anyone looking at him. Either way, apparently he was a lot more afraid of us than we were of him. The rest of the day continued as expected. Although as the day progressed, the winds grew much lighter and lighter, and throughout the night, until we were once again becalmed.
as you can. It's gorgeous out. Hopefully we'll get some more wind soon though. No. I was doing a zoom shot, you got right in the oh. way. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, what was that? It was fish jumping. It's a small one. And just like that, there it was. Okay, well, maybe not exactly, but it was still absolutely beautiful. When the sun rose again, we still had no wind. Twiddling our thumbs, we came up with a wonderful idea. We would take out the dinghy. It was at this moment where we heard a huge explosion. Not just like a small firecracker, but something that shook the water and the boat. Well, as it turns out, we didn't check the chart. And if we had, we would have seen that we were like 10 miles away from a missile testing range. But that didn't stop us. It's time to take the dinghy out. Still with no wind, we noticed a whole bunch of really small fish wow. gathering around the boat as if we were an artificial <laughs> reef out in the middle of nowhere. Well, I dropped a lure in to see what they would do. It's a little small lure about the same size as them, but yet they were just fascinated with it and just about each one of them wanted to bite it. Bite it! Bite it! I wonder if they find it entertaining. With a huge pile of dishes to be done, and growing concern over our fresh water usage because we only had 50 gallons for this entire trip for four people, Maisie cut open the top of one of our empty fresh water containers so that we could do the dishes. Yay! <laughs> 20 gallons in one day, but why all of a sudden did it start leaking? Why did it start leaking? Yeah. Well, 
you're probably wondering what started leaking. Well, that would be our fresh water because we had starting 50 gallons of water. And at this point we had around half full, so about 25, 20 gallons or so. Well, we just checked the water and it was completely gone. Um, I've never left the water on longer than I was using it. Yeah, that's, I turned it off. I don't remember leaving it on. Well, someone left it on a bunch of times. And I kept having to turn it off three or four times. So that, that is probably what happened is that we pumped the water into the village. Yeah. And then pumped it out. All the fresh water. Oh, and the those pumps take care of it? Yeah, of course. Okay. They'll take care of it really quick. So what fitting was that? I don't know. I, I, I haven't found the leak yet. Okay. I can't find the leak until we get water. Close it down. Yeah. Right. This meant that we needed to get to land. We only had about 10 yeah. gallons of emergency water left over that we had saved in jury cans. But the closest port was Port uh, Eads, like about 130, 140 or miles or away. So it's down in the locker I went to figure out if we had enough fuel to make it. So what's up with the fuel stick? Almost 24. Almost 24? Yeah. Uh, so what, what proportion was that of the stick that it's got... about middle between 24 and 39. What did we start off with? More than that. Didn't seem like it actually used that much. No. That's good. I figured it was around a thousand RPM, and that would be close to about 0.8 or so gallons of fuel per hour. And so we motored. We had about five gallons to spare just to get there. So we were really hoping that this would work out and we would catch some wind later on the next day. Another calm day on the Gulf. Been motoring all day. And we will be motoring all night. And so morale was high. We all wanted to get to land because it had been five days since we had our last shower. Not to mention we were completely gross. And that's when we saw it, our first oil rigs. First of many, actually. In fact, the Gulf is completely littered with oil rigs. And in some areas, there's 32 oil rigs within one square mile. It's ridiculous. Between 24 and 39 was where we started. Now we're a quarter of that distance. 15 gallons. So we use one quarter of that distance with 39, 20. Yeah. So 15 gallons, and we used a quarter of that. Yeah. It's four or five gallons. And we were driving for how many hours has this been? Started at 8, that's 12, that's 11, that's maybe 10 hours. 10 hours, so... 10 hours is 5 gallons of fuel. Yeah, so it's pretty close to a half gallon. Yeah. So if, so if you're saying we were between 24 and 39, that's 15, 7 on the 24 is 30, let's say. So that's 5 thousand miles per hour. 20 hours. Yeah, it should be good. Here we are. We should be good. But uh, what? That's assuming that I can read the uh, stick correctly. Yeah, I know. That's a, that's a big assumption. Well, it's a square. It's a rectangular tank. And it's not quite. Oh. But it's mostly rectangular. <clears throat> I just don't know if the markings are correct. Yeah. Because you know, I mean, wouldn't you want to measure the whole amount of fuel you have in there? As opposed to just a short distance of the fuel? So it might be because it's on a, on a lean that 
it gets a little squirrely with geometry and isn't proportional. What do you mean? So it's on a, it's on a lean, so... It I'm not touching the bottom of the stick. Well, how do you do it then? You, it's from the top, and then you measure from on the side. <clears throat> so you go down, you don't dip the stick in? You dip the stick in, Yeah. it's wet, pull it out to the side of the tank. Not knowing how much oh, fuel so we actually inside. had wasn't even yeah. half the issue. But, uh, like now, said, the motor wouldn't even start. I don't know what they mean. It wasn't too long before we figured out why the motor wouldn't start. Well, when we looked at the fuel tank, the fuel tank is made out of fiberglass and plywood. Well, that's not to standard, we'll just say that. And as time went on, the fiberglass deteriorated with the diesel fuel. And as the waves were moving the boat around, it churned up all of this fiberglass. And because it did that, all of that got stuck in an inline filter. The filter was completely clogged. That meant that we could no longer use the fuel tank anymore. And so I had to jury rig a whole bunch of jury cans to be the new fuel tank on the fly. Because there's no one out there. No one can help you when stuff goes bad. You just have yourself and your two hands. And hopefully your wits. Jury rigging a new fuel tank didn't completely solve the problem. Because the only diesel we had was in the tank with fiberglass and growth which meant the only way for us to actually get diesel would be to filter the stuff in the tank. Well, the only way that we could figure out how to do it was with rubber bands have an arrow and coffee filters. So we filtered tank. the diesel from the tank using coffee filters. So what are you working on now? Oh my god, two <laughs> cameras! Get a light! <laughs> with the wind finally picking up, we were able to sail, and thankfully too, because we still hadn't started the motor, or gotten it to start at least. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? With an outdated chart and very little knowledge of what actually was at Port Eads, we called ahead to figure out if a marina was there and if we could get diesel and water. An awful smell in the V-berth kept us up at nights. The reason was because the lid on the sewage tank was open and the tank was full. <laughs> awful. Kept getting a leak, or rather a smell, leak of smell of sewage, and it was just like raw awful throughout the night. Couldn't sleep the past few days because it was awful. And just like every problem on a boat, the only way to fix it, mm -hmm. duct tape. We continued to sail until we got really close to the channel and then began to motor once again. Cautiously examining our fuel amount, we continued on until we finally made it up the channel to Port Eve. Getting in at night meant that we had to wait until morning for the services to be open. But we enjoyed it. We had nice showers and we were finally able to get some good rest. Having got in at night, we really didn't know what Port Eads really looked like. So during the day, in the morning, we decided we should explore a little bit. Port Eads is a wonderful place. In fact, Port Eads is located 20 miles away from the nearest road, which means the only way to get there is by boat. And they have a marina with some 70s or so slips, and it's a really cool place, and the staff is really awesome. Port Eads was established in the 1880s by James Buchanan Eads. 
he wanted to create a better channel for ships to travel through. Now the problem was that the ships originally would have their outlets silted up and it made the whole channel unnavigable. So what he did was he created wooden jetties that narrowed the main outlet of the Mississippi River, causing the river to speed up and cut its channel deeper. This allowed for year-round navigation and safe access to these streams. And so the actual port Eads itself was mainly a lighthouse that was set up to guide ships in. Then, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina smashed Port Eads. In fact, very little remained except for the lighthouse and a few lucky fishing camps. FEMA obligated $400,000 to rebuild Port Eads, but parish president Billy took office in 2007 and felt that $400,000 was insufficient. So he traveled all the way to D.C. personally, and he got FEMA to authorize up to $12 million for a new Port Eads. And that's where we come in, four thirsty sailors on one epic adventure during our crossing of the Gulf. With the water tanks filling up, it was time to go and get the fuel. How many staff are here? Two right now. Mm. Summertime, there'll be about six of us. Oh, wow. A few interns. Mm. But uh, right now, there's three of us total, and we just kind of rotate so nobody goes crazy out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works. Y'all are, are like here at a good time, like last big tournament was last weekend, starting to slow down. When we start to enjoy it a lot more. <laughs> Fishing and duck hunting. And so are you, are you like, yeah, Returning with the fuel, it was time to transfer the fuel into our jury can slash gas tank and get it on board. No, 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 that one's got duck one because that tube's got to go in there. Okay. Damn, kids. What? <laughs> And now, with the jury can on board, it was time to rig it back up to be the gas tank. With just about everything ready to go, it was time to take one last look at this really cool place. Oh, nice view. Is it? Yeah. Yes. Louisiana. 8.12 a.m. Hey, thanks again. Oh, yeah. Are we all settled up? Yep. That's nice. Just like that, we went back to sea. What? See that shrimper behind you? Yeah, he's got right away. Yep.
good wind, so go aloft the sails. Everybody's still sleeping. I've been up since three. That was with Sharon watch with me and after sunrise, a little after we decided to take a nap so I could take a nap later. It's Saturday, September 23rd. Overnight the Marine autopilot compass died. Otherwise, we've gone from a south southwest heading to now west, which will be the heading to 270 in the safety zone shipping channel. There are still a little ways to go. I think we got 10 miles to go, so occasionally we'll see a platform or so like out there. We're on a run almost. Now that we were in the shipping lane, there was a lot more traffic. Tons of cargo ships, huge barges, 200 meters long, ridiculous boats. That's probably got Earl in it. With the forecast looking good, we were all in a good mood. Well, you know how forecasts are. They change. The wind started to howl, the seas began to build, there was a squall upon us. Not knowing the damage done from the storm, we unfurled the jib, but the jib sheets got tangled around one another in one big knot. During the storm, we furled in the jib to hove to with just the mizzen sole out. This is probably the most effective way for us to hove to. However, now we're having such a tough time getting the jib and the jib sheets untangled.
And finally, we were back to sailing. And as the sun began to set, we were finally able to retire from our exhausting day. Continuing our routine, our watch consisted of two teams of two people, and each watch would last for about seven hours or so, and that would be split between the two people. Splitting up the watch like this was a real benefit because it meant that there was always an extra hand right there in the cockpit in case you needed it. All you had to do was wake up the poor soul who was sleeping and tell him to do something. The next morning, we noticed a whole bunch of barn swallows. Now these guys were out here in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we're still over 100 miles offshore, but yet they're just out there, and they're really not long-distance birds. It wasn't too long after that we had yet another visitor, dolphins. Sighting dolphins is really not all that uncommon, in fact we saw them just about every other day. However, this was a huge pod, and we'd gotten used to seeing a whole bunch of jellyfish, moon jellyfish, and they covered the entire gulf, all the way from around Louisiana west. And then it was a bad and a sad sight, because it meant that the ecosystem was not doing so well. But this pod was huge, and they were so playful, they just loved to sit around, play with us, turn around upside down and sometimes you could tell that they were looking at us on the boat. It was wonderful. And then it was idea time. Step one, grab a paddle. Step two, always grab the duct tape. Step three, Grab an underwater camera, turn it on, shove it in the water, and it's time to see the dolphin. And just as free as they came, they left, leaving us with our boat project. Well, Ace was leaning on it or not? Hard to say. Seems like it's just that hose there, spraying onto electrical conduits. Where was it again? It's this hose, this clear hose here. There's a hole right over here, it's squirting out of it. So, I'm gonna clean it off, put some duct tape on it. Tape With the leak fixed, we finally had running fresh water. When the sun rose the next day, we saw the damage that the squall had inevitably done. The squall had weakened the sail, so much so that just with a few gusts, the sail had ripped wide open. So we backwinded the jib so that the damage would be closer to the mast for ease of access. So up I went to try and fix this problem. It was really tough because the seas had not calmed down and we were still rolling around.
with sail tape on hand, I stitched the sail back together using small skinny strips of sail tape. That way the sail wouldn't blow apart when I was applying this really long piece that would actually hold the sail together. And through a lot of pain and effort, the sail was finally taped back together again. In the last three days of the passage, the crew and I were exhausted. Fortunately for us, Having fixed the sail, there really wasn't much else to do. Nothing catastrophic that we had to rush and do. Just small boat projects and boat maintenance and trying to catch up on the Everyone was just so exhausted that no one really even felt like picking the camera up all that much. How bad is it? It's getting more numerous. Of the few things to note, the crew and I did boat projects, slept, ate, slept again, ate, watched a gorgeous sunset, and continued on our way. The seas were building as we were getting closer to our destination, but we were motivated to get there. Because of the remnants of an old hurricane in the Gulf and a new hurricane around Puerto Rico entering the Gulf, the swells were kind of big. Not excessively, but decent. That didn't make the crew delirious, but the captain on the other hand... Yeah, the good one. Gotta get some good ones. We can do some, some boat surfing. Sailboats can surf, you know. With only 50 miles to go, we were all in a chipper mood to get into the channel. Of course it meant we'd get in at night, but we were still excited. Finally motoring, we entered the channel, motored all the way to the dock, and pulled in at about 4 in the morning, and slept. With the boat at the courtesy dock, we only had a few things to do before we could get back to the boat and finally move her to her slip. Hoist the colors? Yeah, when you get to the dock, what do get? What? Well, someone get on and hoist the colors then. Hoist the colors. <laughs> anyway, so we're uh, just moving to our new, uh, our new dock. We were just kind of pulled up at the courtesy dock uh, for the night. Uh, most of the day, went in there, dropped a huge amount of money, at least it felt that way, just to get uh, docked, and then all the paperwork uh, that ensued. Then we had to um, get, get registered, title, the whole, everything, and yet there's a mountain of paperwork that still has to go. It's pretty crazy, but it seems like a really nice spot. We've got wonderful skyscrapers. I'm more of a country person, but cute, quaint downtown.
Once we had gotten to the dock, it was time for us to celebrate. How real men do it. With pliers. <laughs> That's definitely two dollars worth wine. <laughs> And so the very next day, the crew went back home and it was just us on the boat for our next and new adventures. What are you doing?